What's up everyone, it's Kenji here and in this video I'm gonna be sharing five career paths for business students and it obviously also applies to other majors that are somewhat related or overlap with business, right? So things like management, finance or economics are probably also going to be applicable to this video. So the five that I've picked are management consulting, investment banking, big tech, obviously not the software engineering side but more the business side of tech, as well as accounting and then lastly we'll look at entrepreneurship. And basically, I'm going to be rating these based on five stars and the three main metrics that I'm going to be rating them by are number one, the difficulty to get the job, number two, the work-life balance, as in how many hours they have to work for this job, and then lastly, the pay, right? And I'll be getting into actual numbers of how much each one pays, as well as bonuses and other things like that. And obviously, these are just five career paths. They're by no means the only ones. It's just five that I thought would be handy to you as they're fairly popular these days. And if this video does well, um, I will try to make a part two. So make sure you hit that like and subscribe button. So the first career path is management consulting. And if you don't know what management consulting is, it's basically just helping big companies improve their performance in exchange for a fee, right? So at its core, it's just problem solving. Um, consultants are problem solvers in that sense. And uh, some of the examples of say, uh, things that you might be assigned to do or your firm might be assigned to do are, for instance, say BMW is considering entering a new market, say, uh, I don't know, the bicycle market. Then you might be in charge of researching if that market's viable, if it's something that's worth BMW moving into, right? That's just an example, obviously. Another one could be something like, hey, we see our employees at Facebook are, aren't very motivated. Is there a way to change the compensation scheme so that they're gonna be more motivated? So you do research on, hey, is a bonus a good idea to put in here? Are share stock options a good idea? Other things like that, right? And some examples of the biggest uh, management consulting firms are MBB, which stands for one's McKinsey, the other one's Bain, and the other one's BCG, Boston Consulting Group. Those are by far the three biggest ones. There's obviously some, some other ones like Oliver Wyman or Accenture and so on, but I'll be focusing on these big three for now. All right, so the first metric is work-life balance and management consultants are known to work a lot, not as much as investment bankers, which we'll get into in another section, but they still put in a good, say, 70 hours a week, which is definitely a lot more than, say, your average 40-hour work week, right? Um, that said, they also have to travel quite a bit in that maybe they spend a couple weeks in a, in a month outside their offices in a hotel somewhere, basically because they're at their client's office, right? So basically, your client expects you to be there um, throughout the week, which is why they have to travel around so much. Now, obviously this is changing with remote work and other things like that, but it's still fairly common for management consultants to travel. So for those reasons, we will give uh, work-life balance a two star for now. As for the pay, it obviously varies by location, but if you're looking at the big three, McKinsey, BCG, and Bain, they will pay around $110,000 a year if you're in one of the big US cities, right? So basically, $90,000 would be the base salary. You would have a sign-in bonus of around $5,000 and another $15,000 depending on how good your bonus is, right, in terms of performance. But something along the lines of $110,000 is not unrealistic to think of. So it's definitely a lot of money and here's a chart kind of comparing the different ones out there. And here it's also worth noting that the US pays a lot more than most other countries, right? Like look at this chart here where it says that the UK consultant made an average of 46,000 pounds, which if you convert it to US dollars, that's around 65,000. Um, that said, there's obviously cost of living, tax, other things like that, that probably are the reason for the differences. But in order to compare it well to other career options, let's break it down on a per hour basis instead of on an absolute basis, right? So let's say that they work for 50 weeks a year, so they get two weeks of holiday, 50 weeks a year, and when, as we said earlier, they work 70 hours, week, 70 hours a week, right? So that basically gives you around $31 per hour as a salary, which I think is fairly reasonable, so let's put a four star out of five for that. Now, in terms of difficulty, management consulting is definitely very, very hard to get into, especially the big three, as I mentioned earlier, McKinsey, BCG and Bain. They're very, very competitive to get into. They don't disclose acceptance rates, but I'd say it's uh, well below the 5% mark out of the applicants that actually get the job, right? As for locations, typically those locations that don't just speak English, so they have a local language like say Tokyo or Shanghai are probably gonna be a lot less competitive because not that many people speak both Japanese and English or Mandarin and English, right? As opposed to New York or London where you only really need to speak one language, right? And the reason it's so competitive is because a lot of people want this. Basically the job pays well, the job leaves a lot of options open in that consulting is quite a vague uh, industry. So you can obviously move into other areas if you want to later on. So those are the main reasons why it's so competitive. 
And I'll leave this free resource in the description, which is basically going to give you a breakdown of all the necessary steps to get into management consulting, if that's the road you want to take. So in terms of difficulty, we'll give that a five star. All right, so moving on to the second career path, which is investment banking. And if you don't know what investment banking is, at its core, it's two main things. Number one is financing, meaning you help companies and governments raise money in the financial markets. And then number two, it has to do with advisory. So basically, you help them out and you consult them on things related to money. So for instance, hey, how much money should you have in your balance sheet? Where should you allocate your money? Other things like that are what people typically pay them for. And if that's not very clear still, you can check out this other video that I made, which is basically walking through the differences between a commercial bank and an investment bank. And to give you some examples of investment banks, the most renowned out there are known as the bulge bracket, which are basically the largest investment banks in the world. So think like HSBC, Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan, Bank of America, and so on and so forth. There's also some other more specialized, one, which, specialized ones, which are known as boutique investment banks. And these are Centerview, Lazard, and others, which just basically specialize on one specific thing. Now looking into the three main metrics, when it comes to work-life balance, to be honest, there isn't much of a work-life balance. Uh, typically investment bankers work around 80 hours a week, which is even worse than management consultants. And if you wanna see the details of that, I'll put a video up here. This is basically out of, about my time at Goldman Sachs, where I put in a good 80 hours a week, more or less. That also includes weekends. And as for travel, there's typically not that much travel. Um, that's something fairly unusual in investment banking. So for those reasons, we'll put the work-life balance at a one star. In terms of pay, it's definitely very high and hence why you have to work so much. So typically it's around 85,000 as your base salary. On top of that, you get a signing bonus of around 10,000 and you also get a performance bonus, obviously dependent on performance, but it's usually around the $50,000 range. So it gives you a total of around 145,000. As for whether that's a lot or not, let's break it down on a per hour basis to see. So if you work for 80 hours a week for 50 weeks, that gives you around $36 per hour. Obviously it doesn't sound quite as nice as 145,000, but nonetheless it's a lot of money, so we'll give it a five stars for now. In terms of difficulty, investment banking is definitely very, very hard to get into, much like management consulting. If you look at this fun article by Business Insider, which is called the 11 things that are harder to get into than Harvard, it does include Goldman Sachs, which is probably the most sought after investment bank and it has an acceptance rate of 3%. Now, I'd say most other investment banks aren't quite as low, but they're still between the 3 and 5% mark, right? So for those reasons, for difficulty, we'll give that five stars. And I'll leave another free resource in the description for investment banking. I found this one on the internet, and it basically goes through all of the different things that you need to know to recruit for an investment bank, all the way from what is an investment bank to the types of interviews that are out there. So I think it might be useful to you guys. All right, so next up we have big tech, and obviously as business students, you're probably not gonna be working as software engineers, but rather more on the business side of tech, right? So things like account management, business development, finance, accounting, marketing, other things along those lines, right? And as for examples, I mean, I don't think I need to give too many, but the big five are Google, Amazon, Apple, Microsoft, and Facebook, right? Those are regarded as the big five. But obviously there's other big tech companies that you probably use on your day-to-day, -day, like Snapchat or, or Spotify, others along those lines, right? So looking into the metrics, when it comes to work-life balance, it's actually pretty good. Typically, I'd say it's around 40 to 60 hours. That's at least based on my experience at Amazon, as well as some, uh, some of my other colleagues working at Google and places like that. So it's pretty good, I'd say, in that sense. Uh, usually on weekends, you don't have to work unless you, you've messed up or something. Um, so for those reasons, also the dress code, usually there's no dress code. The offices are fairly fancy because they're tech offices. Um, sometimes the food's even free. So for those reasons, we'll give it a five star for work-life balance. So the pay package is a bit confusing in tech and here's why. It basically has three main areas to it. The first one's the base salary, which in the big uh, cities, say New York, San Francisco, Seattle, it's around $80,000. Then secondly, you get what's called the signing bonus which is actually split into two, two years, which is, I don't know why it's a bit confusing. Uh, basically it's around 25,000 for two years, so 12.5 for one year, right? And then in addition to that, you have shares, but obviously the shares are not fixed in value, right? They go up and down, but it's typically around the $50,000 mark. That said, you don't actually get the shares on your day one. Instead, they have what's called a vesting period, which essentially means that you can only get them after you've worked for a set period of time at the company, right? So yeah, even more confusing. But anyways, let's just put 100,000 as your year one salary for now. 
And basically, if you're working 50 hours a week, say, that's the average of the 40 hours and 60 that we said before, and then you work for 50 hours, that probably gives you around the $40 mark per hour, right? Which on a relative basis is definitely a lot better than investment banking and management consulting. So we'll put that a five star for now. In terms of difficulty, obviously software engineering is very difficult to get into at a big tech firm. But on the other hand, for more business oriented roles, the truth is that there's just not that much information on it. I even worked at Amazon myself and I wasn't able to gather much information about it. So um, yeah, I'm just gonna not be able to give you much data on this. So we'll just put a three star in terms of difficulty for now. All right, so the fourth career option is accounting. And if you don't know what accounting is, it's basically the way for a company to maintain accurate records of their financial position. So if they wanna look at things like, hey, how much profit did we make last year? Or hey, um, how much do we have in sales? How much do we owe the bank again? Other questions like that can easily be solved with accounting, right? So the role of an accountant is basically two ways. The first one is to find these figures, so calculate them, that's accounting. And then the other one is auditing, which is basically verifying that these accounts are actually true and that they make sense, right? So I personally worked at PwC as an intern, as, a, as an auditor. And basically they would send me out to a client, say to the Volkswagen group with my team, obviously, and we would get into their finance team and start to look at their accounting, right? So if everything makes sense or not, and then we would create what's called an audit report. And based on that, we would certify that their accounts are correct or they're incorrect, right? So when you see big uh, accounting scandals, like those of Wirecard that we saw recently in Germany, that's basically got to do with accounting and auditing. Now, some examples of the big accounting firms are known as the big four, which stand for PwC, EY, KPMG, and Deloitte. Those are the big four. Um, they basically have offices really all around the world. If you uh, live in a decent sized city, odds are they're gonna be there. Um, they have around 200,000 to 300,000 employees. So they're really, really massive. And uh, they also have some other departments, not just accounting, right? They also do things like consulting. They do things like legal services, transactions, and other things like that. Now, when it comes to work-life balance, I'd say it's fairly similar to big tech in that they probably work around 40 to 60 hour weeks. Um, it does get somewhat busy during say January to, to March during that spring season and the reasons that most companies are closing their accounts and they're getting ready to file taxes and things like that, right? But overall, uh, the perks are not quite as good as big tech in that you, you still have to go in a suit because you're meeting clients. Um, the office is typically not as, as cool or as fancy, if you will, as that of a tech firm, but I'd still give it out of uh, work-life balance, I'd say a four star is fairly reasonable. So for the pay in the big US cities like New York and San Francisco, there's usually two main parts to it. The first one's the base salary, which is usually around the $60,000 mark. And then you have the bonus, which obviously depends on performance, right? But it's usually around the, around the $5,000 mark. So that's 65,000 in total. If we put that on a relative basis to compare to the other ones, let's say they work for 50 hours a week and uh, they work for 50 weeks, that probably leaves you at around $26 per hour which is not bad, as in you're probably not gonna start from that, but at the same time, it's nowhere near some of the other industries, right? So for those reasons, we'll give it a three-star rating. Now, in terms of difficulty, it's nowhere near as competitive as investment banking or management consulting. And basically the reasons that um, a lot of people think that accounting is boring, I'm, I'm not saying that's my case, I'm not getting into that, but yeah, a lot of people think that it's boring and hence why it's not as competitive, right? So basically, if, if you have a good degree and uh, you have good grades, odds are you'll at least get to the interview stage. So for those reasons, when it comes to difficulty to getting the job, we'll give it a two star. All right, so the last option in this video is entrepreneurship. And that's basically just starting your own business, right? I don't think I need to give many examples, but some of the more recent, say, startups that went mainstream include DoorDash that was founded in 2013, um, what else is there? There's Robinhood, also founded in 2013, as well as um, WeWork, which was founded in 2010. So looking at the three main metrics when it comes to work-life balance, the reality is that um, as an entrepreneur, you're probably gonna have to work a lot, a lot more than you would in your regular job, at least if you want your business to do well, right? Um, when looking at the successful companies out there, most of the founders said they did work over 80 hours a week, weekends inclusive. And at the end of the day, you're only giving yourself an advantage if you work longer, right? So for those reasons, um, assuming that you want your business to do well, we'll put uh, the work hours at five stars. As for pay, it's hard to say. Most businesses, to be honest, end up failing. And so they obviously don't generate any money, right? Which is why they fail. But on the other hand, if you look at the Forbes list, most of the billionaires up there are company founders. 
Uh, I'm not saying that your company is gonna get to that level, but there is that upside potential that say your regular job doesn't have, right? So for pay, for now, I'm just gonna put two stars as it's probably more likely that it goes uh, bankrupt or that your business fails as opposed to it, say, becoming, uh, getting on the Forbes list, right? And lastly, when it comes to difficulty, entrepreneurship is one star, mainly because you don't need the permission from anyone to do it. Um, it's not like you need to get into an interview or anything like that. You just go ahead and get started. Now, I'm not saying that the business is gonna do well. Obviously, that depends on other factors, but to start it, you don't really need anything. So yeah, those are five career options for business graduates. Um, I do realize that for salaries, it's a bit of a rough guide in that if you live in other cities that are not, say, the big ones in the US, uh, they're probably gonna pay you a bit less, especially because the cost of living is gonna be less, right? And the same applies if you live abroad, probably the US pays the most compared to other European cities or, or cities in Asia, right? And also I do wanna mention that if there's any inaccuracies, feel free to point them out in the comments, right? I'll try to pin them if uh, I think it's correct. Obviously I want the best information to be out there for you guys. And lastly, I realized that most of the things that I analyzed are more numbers oriented, if you will. So if you'd like me to do more uh, letters oriented type of career options for business students, so those like, that relate to say marketing, HR, advertising, other things like that, do hit that like and subscribe. If the video does well, I'll consider doing it. So hope you found it useful and I'll hopefully catch you in the next one.